All right, everyone, I'd like to thank you for coming to see Woodpeckers, the great debate. Are lawyers Luddites or is technology to blame? This webinar is sponsored by Woodpecker. Woodpecker is a document automation company that is a plug-in for Word. Um, it's really simple, easy stuff to use. And you'll see our agenda today. We first talk about the fact that lawyers don't use technology. Now, that's a bold statement. Maybe we'll be proven wrong. Um, and then we'll ask, are lawyers Luddites? And then we'll go on to ask, well, maybe it's not that. Perhaps it's legal tech companies that are failing the lawyers. And finally, what is it that you can do? You know, this, this needs to be about the folks out there in the audience. And so the great news is we have an absolutely fantastic lineup of speakers today. Um, we couldn't ask for a better bunch. Um, I am really, I know people sometimes think I'm somewhat cynical, folks who, who know I do these webinars, but I, I am very sincere to be very humbled by the fact that we have folks like Bob Ambrogi, um, who everyone knows from law sites, from Lexblog, um, for his articles for many years. If there is a voice of truth in the legal tech industry, it is Bob. Bob, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Mike. Glad to be here. And then we've got Joe Patrice. Joe Patrice is definitely a voice. Um, I, I, I'd like to think he is a voice for his own truth. Um, in fact, Joe reminds us even just as of yesterday uh, when he published, Happy Law Day. Remember that the law is mostly terrible. Um, the good news is we think this webinar will be great, particularly since we have Joe on board. Hey, Joe, um, thank you for being here. Hey, absolutely. All right. And, hey, Joe, you may need to turn the microphone up a little bit. It's still a little hard to hear you. Um, and then finally, and, and, and this is truly a last but not least in any way, is John Tobin. Um, John, unlike Joe and Robert, uh, you, you, you may not have heard of, but a few years ago I came across John's writings, um, and they are uh, incisive, and they are disruptive, and they are – really telling it like it is. Um, John is truly one of those rare, rare folks who is a practicing attorney with a genuine and thriving practice, and yet he is also uh, an innovative technologist. And um, I think you'll find uh, he's got an amazing view on this stuff. And John, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And then there's me, your moderator. Um, I'll chime in from time to time, uh, keep things moving, but the best news is I'm going to try and talk as little as possible. Uh, I'm Mike Simon, and so we will get to this in just a second, but I do want to tell folks, if you have questions, we are more than happy to uh, uh, answer those questions. Uh, at time, actually, it's funny. We've got a Zoho is a little bit of a do-it-yourself system, so I may have to drop out and check them. Um, we've got folks who um, actually will text me those questions um, if there's something I want to ask. If it's more of a technical question, uh, that will be answered in line via text in the in the whole mechanism for Zoho. But there's a Q&A icon on the left of your screen. Type it in. Just click the Ask button. And, uh, again, if it's something that we should be talking about, uh, uh, it's a question for one of the presenters, we'll, we'll try and get it texted to me so I can do that. All right. So let's start with this. Lawyers don't use technology, or at least not nearly enough. Now, we're going to go through a bunch of surveys and studies. I'm, I'm, you know, again, since Bob is the truth teller in this industry, I'm going to hand them to him. And, in fact, he's written about some of these. So, um, you know, Bob, let's start with this Thomson Reuters report for this year. Yeah, well, you know, I, I hate to be put in the position of opening up on the topic of, of saying lawyers don't use technology because I, I, don't, I don't really believe that. And I think in a lot of ways – Lawyers have been uh, ahead <clears throat> ahead of the curve over the years in in using technology, but you know the the the, the fact of the matter is that uh, there's there's kind of a uh, uh, an avant garde perhaps of the legal profession that's that's really proficient to technology, uh, and there's a, a whole lot of uh, a trailing edge people out there. So 
Uh, I mean, this survey is just one example of stuff we could talk about, but this was something I, I wrote about just recently. The Thomson Reuters does a uh, uh, has has for the past three years done a survey of solo and small firm lawyers, and one of the uh, areas they ask quite a bit about is use of technology, and. Interestingly, for the last three years that they've done this survey, essentially what they have found, uh, that the headline out of this year's survey was kind of that there's, that there's been nothing new in this year's survey. In other words, for the last few years, they found that lawyers recognize that they uh, face many challenges and that, and that a significant one of those challenges is keeping up with changes in legal technology and adoption of legal technology. Uh, and yet, this, despite recognizing these challenges, they tend to do very little about them. Uh, and in this case, the survey's authors describe the situation as a persistent lack of action among solo and small firms. So make of that what you will. Um, but this survey, we can go to the next slide, I think. So this, one of the things the survey did is to kind of talk about um, their uh, use, uh, the challenges that they face, as, as I said, and uh, one of the, they, they recognize sort of three main areas of, of challenges, but one of the, uh, what they identified as one of the top areas of, 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 of uh, challenges for them is the increasing complexity uh, of, of technology. Uh, and uh, Yet when they've asked uh, to what extent they've addressed this challenge in their practices, barely more than a third have said they've done any changes to, to keep up with it. Um, it also asked uh, lawyers about uh, technology systems that they'd implemented within the past 12 months. Uh, and uh, overall in the survey, actually, something like less, just less than half, 45% of firms said they had adopted new technology. But when you really kind of look at it, there, there isn't a lot of significant adoption of new technology over the past 12 months. I mean, the most common areas were sort of the old, old standbys of case management, time and billing, document drafting, document management. Um, and, and, you know, that, out, yellow outlined uh, uh, bar uh, chart way over on the right hand side of the slide uh, shows that you know 67% overall basically said none of the above. Um, and I, I forget what I said this, but this is this survey is of firms of under 30 lawyers. So this is not across the board. This is firms of under 30 lawyers. Um, and, and you'll notice, I mean, kind of noticeably absent anywhere in, in this in terms of. Uh, technology that have adopted or something like artificial intelligence. And, and uh, I'd asked the Thomson Reuters people whether they asked about that. And they said they didn't specifically ask about AI. And so that may be a reason that's not on here. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. Where's the blockchain, Bob? Yeah, hey, Bob, where's, where's the blockchain, the blockchain right? on the... <laughs> right. Yeah, where's the blockchain? Didn't ask about that either, I'm sure. Um, and then when they're asked about technology systems that they plan to implement over the next 12 months, I mean, the, the sort of the bottom line here is it looks like they're not really doing much uh, to upgrade over the next uh, over the next year or so. Um, again, the only significant uh, area where they plan to invest, not significant, that's, that's an overstatement of it. The, 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 the number one answer of, of the area technologies that they plan to uh, invest in over the next 12 months is electronic signatures <laughs> with a full 8% saying they're going to invest in better e-signature e technology. Uh, but again, uh, you go down to that uh, yellow highlighted uh, chart in the bottom right here and you'll see overall it's based almost 80% say none of the above uh, in terms of what they plan to do um, over the next over the next couple of over the next year so uh, you know uh, that's that's kind of one look at, um, at at the state of this uh, and uh, you know we can talk about what that means but uh, that's kind of laying out the case here a little bit Michael Thank you, Bob. And, you know, uh, I probably should apologize for putting you on the spot there to, 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 to maybe 
start by implying perhaps that lawyers are Luddites, um, and, and I wouldn't want you to do that because um, I know you don't believe it. But I sometimes wonder if, if perhaps what we're seeing is less of the fact that lawyers are not uh, – implementing new systems, upgrading to new systems. Maybe they're not Luddites. Maybe it's just so much there's options, but not nearly enough good options. And, in fact, when we turn to the rivals, I would say cross-town, but I think they're more cross-continent rivals of Thomson Reuters, LexisNexis, they've got a report they did uh, late last year uh, called, they called Looking Past the Hype um, on their in-house lawyer's report. And uh, I will apologize for folks. This is a, a big chart. It's a very slick chart, but it's a big, very detailed chart to take in. Um, but what it does show is there are lots of options for in-house tech folks to use and other attorneys. But there's also some bad news, um, and it might be they're not using it all that much. Hey, John, um, what do you see here? Well, I mean, I do see that a lot of this has been used or there is a plan to use it. So I think the question then becomes, um, who are those people or those in-house counsel who have no plans to introduce this technology? And then I think the secondary question is, why? Is it because they're Luddites or is it because maybe they don't understand the value of this technology, it hasn't been presented, or the current way works well enough? You know, so maybe they've, they have a system, they have a means of working that works for them now. But um, I think that what they need to see is what are the benefits of adding one of these systems? What are the benefits of e-signatures, document automation, contract review? Um, and beyond that, I think there are concerns, which I think we'll talk about later in this webinar. But um, I think for me, when I see a survey like this, I really have questions about, well, why is it that these uh, lawyers or in-house counsel don't have plans to introduce the technology? Those are good questions. I mean, it's um, – and I do think in some ways if they're not seeing the value and they're also not seeing why it is they need to move away from what they've got now, which might not be very effective, that's almost two sides of the same point in terms of value, I think. You know, I don't know. Um, I will say, and, and we decided to pick out just one of these, and, you know, I'll admit it happens to be document automation, uh, maybe perhaps in deference to our sponsors here, Woodpecker, who do this. Um, and we see, you know, over on the left, um, when it is implemented, that's that, that chart. I don't know if folks can see my mouse. I doubt it. Um, but over here on, on the right, sorry, on the right, document automation, the impact, when it is used, Almost two-thirds of the time, there is improvement. It's just it's not used all that often, 15%. And so what we've got here is kind of a disappointment. You know, it's, it's more than 50% of in-house lawyers surveyed by LexisNexis don't plan on implementing this. And I suspect that's because it's a technology that we've seen lots of times out there, that hasn't always been a great alternative to what you're doing, of just going through with Control-F or reading through it. We, it hasn't always made the value uh, apparent. And so we move to another report, and this one I will, I will uh, send back to Bob to talk about. I, I can't remember if you wrote about this one or not. Um, I kind of assume you always do, but I didn't find it. This is the ABA uh, Tech Report 2018, and I really was struck <laughs> by this particular section on technology training about how um, lawyers seem to be far more confident in recent years, even though they seem to be receiving far, far less training. Um, why is that, Bob? Yeah, you know, I, I didn't actually write about this this year, and I, and I almost always do write about it. I just uh, haven't gotten a chance to do that this year. But the... Um, so I mean, this is this is kind of somebody else's conjecture. I mean, Mark Roche uh, wrote wrote this piece about this, uh, in which he noted that uh, you know the, the lawyers are feeling more more comfortable about technology, uh, and that that seemed he suggested that seemed to be at odds with the fact that they're reporting significant lower rates of access to training for their technology. Um, and, and he seems to conclude that wouldn't uh, necessarily support the fact that they are, in fact, more more comfortable. Uh, and, and he he conjectures about this uh, 
this this Dunning Kruger effect. And God, I'd sworn I was never going to talk about Dunning Kruger in a webinar, but here I am doing it. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the Dunning Kruger effect is the sort of idea that that people tend to uh, when people are asked to assess their own abilities in any particular area, they they tend to inflate their abilities and. Uh, they, uh, you know, the, the Kruger effect is that Dunning Kruger effect is that people have a general tendency to quote fail to adequately assess their level of competence, specifically their incompetence at a task, and thus consider themselves much more competent than everyone else. Um, you know, it's hard for me to say that that's what's going on with lawyers, and it's so. Of course, it's so. When you're talking about this whole Luddite issue and all that, it's just so hard to generalize because. As I said earlier, there are so, so many lawyers who are on the really on the leading edge of tech, and so many who are on the trailing edge, and so many in between, and so much depends on the kind of practice. But I, I don't think it's just about access to training, uh, and I'm surprised actually that the study found the training is going down because we've now seen in the past year at least a couple of states now that are actually making tech training a, a, a condition. Uh, of continuing legal education uh, and uh, of remaining licensed. So there's greater awareness, I think, about tech training uh, going on now. So uh, I'm not sure what to make of this study uh, in this conclusion, but uh, I don't think it's just about training, that's for sure. Okay, well, thank you. Hey, Joe, you know, I know certainly yeah. you write, uh, uh, and folks that above the law write about a lot of Dunning-Kruger-esque things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely. Um, yeah, it, I mean, Bob gave a very good definition of it, though a definition that I think was nicer than the common one I use, which is that Dunning-Kruger is about the concept that at a certain point you become so incompetent you can't even tell that you're incompetent, uh, and then you just barrel forward making continually stupider and stupider decisions. And yeah, I'm taking kind of the stand that there is a problem amongst lawyers and technology. Um, and I don't know, though, I necessarily think it's a problem. I, I'm just saying it's there, and lawyers aren't particularly good at these things. And there's definitely an effect, maybe not for all lawyers, there are certain lawyers who know what are, what's up, but for most lawyers, there's a Dunning-Kruger effect where they believe not so much that they don't need technology, they just don't understand it. And they have this incompetence effect that we're talking about here. So I think there's a, I think there's another study. There we go. Yeah, so... This is a study uh, from Florida Bar about that really shows this in effect, right? Where is the legal is your legal office having difficulty adapting to changes in legal technology? So, twelve percent of people think that, that it's a problem for them. Only twelve percent. Seventy percent think they're doing just fine. Now, I'm pretty confident this is an untrue, not just because I've talked to people uh, involved with the Florida Bar who say that there are problems with the lawyers' adoption, but I'm also I'm overgeneralizing the Florida man test to include Florida lawyers. Uh, I haven't done that, typed in a date and Florida lawyer, but I'm sure if I did, something horrible would come up. The point is, these folks believe that they've actually ad adapted well, and the problem is kind of a twofold Dunning-Kruger, probably. There's undoubtedly some folks who think they're trying to adapt, think they're doing a good job of adapting, and are just not. Uh, these are the sort of people who have gone completely paperless, but put it on an unsecured Dropbox, something like that, where they think they're doing the right thing, but they're really failing, uh, and they don't see why. There's also those who mistakenly they just misidentify what they think good tech even is, the kind of people who say, we are absolutely at the bleeding edge. That's why we have Windows ME. They're, those people are out there too, but whichever way you go, there's when you get to this 70%, considering, I think, Bob says there are some this avant-garde, this vanguard of good lawyers who know what, what's up. And I think that's probably true. And that's probably 10% of that 70 who disagree. And the rest are people who are just not seeing, for fact that they aren't familiar enough with it, where they're falling short. Yep, I think it's a very good point. Joe, I can good this is Bob. I can Microsoft Bob. Oh, that's Bob, yeah? Yeah, I was just going to say I, I, I actually did kind of Google uh, Google Florida Bar Tech Competence because I did a I did a uh, uh, a presentation extensive presentation on tech ethics in Florida a while ago and uh, I found any number of ethics uh, opinions out of Florida involving some pretty pretty stupid lawyer tricks uh, involving technology. So there is a lot out there. 
Not to pick on Florida, but. I mean, why not? Is it enough I mean, to make the 12 percent? <laughs> <laughs> there tend to be a lot of stupid yeah. Facebook trips more more than anything. But you know. there you go. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, hey, John. Actually, you know, we've talked about. Yeah. Uh, uh, I guess some could say it's ignorance is bliss, but I don't know. I I I'm not so sure this shows this new survey here shows a lot of bliss. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting survey. Um, I would actually be, again, I think my sort of position with a lot of this is I just have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions about um, what the outmoded technology looks like, um, what, you know, sort of what, what what's the actual pain point is what I'm trying to get to here. Um, what is it that, you know, an attorney who's working at a firm, uh, what problem are they seeing? So going beyond just a sort of uh, blanket term of technology or outmoded technology, um, I'd be curious to know, like, is it a problem where the technology is too hard to use? Maybe they have a document automation system, but it's terrible. Maybe the interface is just really bad, and so it's hard to use, and nobody wants to deal with it. Um, maybe scheduling systems are difficult, or they don't like using Outlook. Um, so, I, again, I have I have questions about, again, I want to dig deeper into what are the pain points? What are the specific tasks that these attorneys are finding um, so onerous that they'd consider a career change within the next year? And, it, and, it, and again, is this the real answer? I mean, is that the real reason or is it just a partial reason? So, yeah, I think there are questions that can be asked about the survey. I didn't look at the entire results, but, um, you know, I think this result definitely speaks to, you know, a need to help educate attorneys, if nothing else, and sort of create a feedback loop within a firm so that if you are implementing, te implementing technology, get, get feedback from the users, get feedback from the attorneys who are actually using the technology to make sure that it's, it's fitting, making sure that it works, because um, it's just as easy to implement a bad solution as it is to implement a good one. And so, you know, a firm might be thinking, hey, we're we're rolling out this new solution, we're rolling out a new piece of technology, we're doing the right thing, but the users don't like it. And so I think that could also be a problem here, too. Those are very good points. Which brings us to the question. We won't ask this of Bob. We'll ask this of Joe, our lawyers Luddites. And we've seen a lot of your writings, Joe. Um, this one, I think, speaks for itself uh, when, when, when we say uh, Luddites in the title, so we won't spend too much time on it. But this one, now admittedly, this is from your colleague, Brian Dalton, um, but, you know, I, I think it's somewhat similar to some of the other things that you have written. Um, can you tell us about some of these surveys that, that you folks at Above the Law love to write about? Or studies, yeah, I well, so this, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, so this is, this is a study that Casey Flaherty and Suffolk put together where they found that it's not just some generational thing. There, there are definitely those of us who will joke around and say that the problem with tech adoption in the legal world are those crusty old partners who still try to communicate via the suite, the inter-office mail, and they don't understand tech, but the young people are going to get it. And it, what this study turned out was that's not actually true. Uh, giving a test to the younger attorneys, it turns out that they had no idea what was going on either. Uh, and that's, from my perspective, that's not actually something that should be too surprising. And we treat it as though, wow, this is some sort of huge problem. But, you know, they're they're not coders. They are lawyers. Uh, that is a skill set that is very different than being a, being a computer programmer or a tech person. And it's kind of unfair that we try to pretend that they should be all digital native experts and everything. Uh, they're experts in law. And it's important. I think we'll get into this a little bit when we talk about whether or not the tech companies are to blame, but to blame the attorneys, too, it comes to kind of an attitude change of not embracing the fact that you don't know. Uh, this goes back to that Dunning-Kruger argument that, to some extent, these younger lawyers, the problem here for me in this study is not, hey, they don't, they aren't really great with tech. It's that if you ask those associates, they probably think they are. And that's the Dunder problem, that we need to get over ourselves as a profession and recognize I am not a software developer, and I don't have to. What I have to be is a lawyer, and I have to understand that I have a gap there. And that's the way in which we can start to embrace and let in these people who are trying to give us products that could actually be valuable to our practice. Very cool. Well, um Hey, you know, I, 
I do have a, we did have a question come in, so I want to throw this out there. Um, the question is, how do you think the onset of the new Windows 10 channel cycle will impact adoption and usability? Um, I have to admit, I, I, I know Windows, there's doing something for Windows 10 and the way you can get software. I'm not real familiar with it. Is, uh, hey, John, is this something you've worked with? Um, I'm a Mac person, so I'm not familiar with this. Ah, okay. I won't ask you then. Not fair. Hey, I bet Bob, though. Bob, you've got to know about this. Have you written about the, the this channel? I, I have not written about this, um, and so hmm. I don't know the answer. Um, but, we you know, I think... The panel. I, I do hey, think... Joe? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to stop the panel, right? Yes. Yeah, I'm also a Mac, so... Yeah. Yeah, I know. So, that, hey, I, um, so for the folks, person who asked that, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think the, uh, I mean, I do think that that the the great, this is Bob. I, I don't think the greater issue about uh, adoption within the legal profession, you know, has to do with uh, any kind of a um, an enhancement to Windows 10 or something along those lines. I, it's there, you know. I mean, to the extent I think that we see obstruction, there, there's a couple of things. We, 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 there's a little bit of a blaming the victim thing going on here. I mean, there's some bad tech out there that makes it harder for lawyers to adopt. But th there are just – there's a mindset in the legal profession against technology uh, that, that I've railed about, that I know Joe's railed about, that other people have railed about. Uh, and, and it comes down to that, that bottom line of the fact that, that lawyers – the entire – way we practice law, the business model of the way we practice law is, is sort of set up against technology, set up against efficiency. You know, we, we build by the hour. We don't want to be more efficient. We don't necessarily want to use technology. That, that's, that's the kind of problem, I think, that really gets in the way of a lot of this stuff. Yeah, and, and I think it's a good point. In fact, the funny thing is now we have um, our audience answering questions for the rest of the audience. I didn't realize we could do this on, on Zoho. It's a pretty cool feature that uh, I guess we should have looked into. And one of our folks, uh, thank you, David, um, has mentioned to some degree this is going to be driven, at least in Windows 10, by the fact that Windows 7 and 8 are being sunsetted, So, which is bad news for me because I'll admit I'm a big Windows 7 fan. Um, so we'll see whether it drives me to do anything better. And perhaps then, if it doesn't, I'll be in this next uh, article uh, next time that Joe writes about stupid lawyer tricks, the legal tech edition, just a few years ago, and we could probably write these fairly regularly. Hey, Joe, normally I'd ask you about this, but is it okay if we, 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 we stop making you the bad guy for a while? Sure. Sounds great to me. All right. <laughs> So, hey, you know, they, they, they talk about, you know, legal profession seems to be in the midst of a perfect storm of technolo technological ineptitude. Bob, you've talked about that, some of the Florida stuff. Do um, you want to tell us, you know, maybe one of the, the horror stories here? Well, the, I mean, the redaction one just keeps coming up again and again, right? I mean, it, the uh, we, we, just, we just saw this recently in, in, in January with uh, – with the Manafort's lawyers having having filed documents in response to uh, Mueller uh, investigation uh, in which they failed to adequately redact documents, but this, this was a case a couple actually a couple of years ago, I think it was 2017, where you, you kind of think the lawyers at the Department of Justice Criminal Division are going to get it right, are going to know how to redact the document, uh, and yet they filed. Uh, a document in, in a story that was closely being followed by the media, a particular reporter at Law 360 happened to go into PACER and download the document after the DOJ uh, filed it and uh, realized, you know, did, did the old copy and paste, which is the kind of the easiest way to figure out uh, if a document's been properly redacted and found uh, that sure enough, you could, you could see uh, what was supposed to be a highly confidential uh, uh, government information uh, just by copying and pasting. This, this reporter had a conscience, apparently, and, and uh, went and notified uh, the, the DOJ of the fact, and, and they were able to quickly substitute a properly redacted document. But it's happened in some other cases where, the, where the, you know, the, the, the redacted information has ended up on the, on the front page of the, of the newspaper. Uh, so... Um, that's uh, that's one stupid lawyer trick. Yeah, I mean it's it's not like uh, the Paul, Paul Manafort's lawyers on the other side of the DOJ uh, 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 can't also um, say they haven't 
fallen uh, of a reporter who was uh, kind. Hey, John, is is this the kind of technology, bad technology that leads to workarounds, that leads to, you know, the problem? I mean, is this the kind of thing you were talking about? Um, this one, I mean, this one, as I'm hearing this story, and I've heard stories like this, um, I think this one I would probably more chalk up to the lack, a lack of proper training. Um, I mean, if the tools are there, if they're available, um, I don't redact documents as part of my practice, but I can imagine it's probably a fairly trivial thing to do if you know how. Now, I think this might go back to the Dunning-Kruger issue where you think you know how, and so you go ahead and put a black image over the text or whatever it is that they're doing, not knowing that you made that mistake. And you might have been making that mistake for years. So I think this one I'd actually categorize more as a mistake with uh, training. And so I do think that, you know, kind of going back a little bit, you know, along with technology adoption, we want to make sure that the users know how to use it. Awesome. So I guess I've accomplished something. But I feel I like you have to try pretty hard not to properly redact a document these days. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, I've got you all to talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect. I am, uh, you know, we're going to talk about another story, but, you know, I'm going to skip that in favor of tossing another question out there because we're getting tons of them. Thank you, folks. Um, we've got someone who has asked, you know, they want us to kind of break it down and, you know, the technologies we're talking about and the specific types, for which, unfortunately, the answer is, hey, do you want to be here all day? Because we could, we could do three hours on that. But she did ask something that I think is really, we can definitely answer in the time allotted, which is, is there something that lawyers are doing well? And, you know, is that e-discovery? Are, 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 are there things that we actually, we can say, we got this? I mean, I don't know if you can say you've got this, but you can definitely you can definitely point to successes that have happened, and you can tell those successes by the mundaneness of them, right? I mean, it is we are long past the period where every lawyer is connected when they're out of the office because they have a smartphone or some similar device that lets them read their emails when they're not around. That is a success story as far as tech adoption. Uh, and that's, and those things are here and there. Like, there are issues where lawyers can see the value, understand it, are comfortable with it, and have adopted it. There are other technologies that either aren't something they need to adopt and they have, or are things they need to adopt and aren't, that they don't necessarily grasp. And, you know, some of that's their own uh, hubris and failure to understand what's out there. Some of it is you know, a square peg, round hole relationship with the tech industry. Uh, to, there are some products out there that are being designed for other uses that firms are trying to force into a service legal practice model that don't actually work particularly well. Those are failures. But it, it's kind of all over the place. It, but I really do think it goes back to what is mundane. And if there is a, technolog a technological adoption that – has reached the point where you don't even think about it anymore. That's the success story. That's good. I mean, Anybody I think there's any number of areas where lawyers are doing are doing. Yeah, yeah. This is Bob. Can you hear me? Yep. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I, I think there's any number of areas in which I think there's any number of areas in which lawyers are doing well. Uh, it, it, in using technology. And again, that's why it's so hard to generalize about this stuff. I think, you know, you can talk about sort of a, a so-called leading edge technology like artificial intelligence or machine learning. Uh, and, you know, as we said, e-discovery is a great example of how machine learning has been used very effectively by a number of law firms to uh, streamline the course of conducting discovery. Uh, machine learning is being used by some firms very effectively in, in contract review and in due diligence review. Uh, and yet there are plenty of other lawyers out there who, you know, if you talk about AI or machine learning, just throw their hands up in the air and say, I don't want to hear about, you know, robots taking my job. So it, it just there, there, you can look at almost any. You can look at document automation as another example where there are some lawyers who have – who are extremely proficient uh, at uh, developing uh, – the use of document automation within their practices, uh, even to the point of, you know, streamlining the ability of clients to sort of do it themselves uh, to, to some level before they even have to call the lawyer in to, uh, to uh, assist with something. So, uh, you know, there's lots of examples out there. You just need to look around. Yeah, and I think a 
final one on the front end would also be um, – I've noticed in the past few years, a lot of lawyers are getting much more sophisticated with digital marketing. So things like um, having a website where there's people can chat with somebody or get on the phone quickly with somebody, or even um, some lawyers are deploying tools that people can use to help themselves to calculate the, you know, the value of a case or something like that. So I think lawyers are really catching on to the value of digital marketing and how you can get clients that way. So that's something that's a positive sign. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, so, you know, I will we'll skip ahead a little bit. I was going to uh, admit to Joe here we played a little bit of a trick on him on the stupid lawyer tricks. In fact, this is Bob's story instead of Joe's. I think it shows the extent to which we all write about these things. Um, yeah. And so, you know, one final note here. You know, I do want to be fair Joe, to people. Joe and I are interchangeable anyway. <laughs> you know, that's why we never see you in the same place. Um, I guess just yeah. the question is, which one oh, of you right. is Clark Kent and which one is Superman? I don't know. Um, or Lex Luthor. Um, so, you know, Joe, I think, to be fair to him, <laughs> has has softened a bit in years. And so why don't, Joe, uh, you, you tell us, uh, uh, you know, admit that you've become a little bit of a softie. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is that the word Luddite uh I use much more colloquially as anybody who doesn't really understand technology, but I've kind of adopted more of a precise definition. Uh, the Luddites were, you know, people who actively tried to thwart the advance of technology in the industrial age. And I don't, I don't think lawyers are by and large that. There may be a few crusty old folks left, but more or less, I think the Dunning-Kruger argument is a much closer worldview for me. And this, uh, article in this selection you have here is kind of what, what I was going about earlier. The the people who are actively against the advance of technology are pretty much gone. But what we do see is people who don't understand what they want. Now, the examples I have here are like ones that I was just talking about, like word processors, good. We're all on board with having computers and using those instead of having a typing pool, put everything together. Artificial intelligence, bad. They don't understand it. Smartphones are good. Social media, bad. Like they... There's a picking and choosing, and it's more of a comfortability with their own competence levels and the ability to get over the fact that they do have some incompetencies. That's more what's the problem here than somebody who actively wants to go back to the good old days where we shepherdized everything with books. I think that's gone. Uh, and so that's why I, I've stepped away from maybe the more technical term Luddite, but I do think I'm, I'm still – I'm still mean enough to say that a lot of the problem is in the uh, is in the lawyers' camp. Wow, shepherdizing with books. Now that I read, um, I'm I'm going to try to read this. Wow, I just forgot that uh, yeah. this article. Um, I believe I compare them compare the whole thing to Mean Girls. So there, that's uh, me. You <laughs> yeah. Go back and read the whole thing to make sense that I ended on the word whore. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes. So I'm. I meanwhile, I'm just Joe. I have to admit, I'm going to have PTSD over over shepherdizing from books. Wow. Um. I remember those days. I just, yeah. Um. So that brings us to the final part of. Well, we got the, the final part with with our with uh, uh. We're going through this question, the debate. Before we get to what you can do with it, sorry, I'm, I'm a little discombobulated again. PTSD from shepherdizing. You know, are lawyers? You know, are is is it, is it the legal tech companies? Are are we building the right things? Are we building things for lawyers? And you know, this is the article that I found a few years back of John's that just really hit me. And and the phrase, you know, why lawyers don't adopt legal technology? And I'll say it because he said it because most of it sucks. Um, you know, John really does live this. And so um, why don't you take us through some of the things you've said in this article and some of the other ones on, you know, as a person who, as a guy who has lived this life of trying to use legal technology when most of it sucks. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think it does come down to what you're putting up on screen here. A lot of it um, is about bad assumptions. Um, and it's also about assumptions about what lawyers need and what lawyers are willing to adopt. And I think sometimes, um, not all the time, there's a lot of great legal tech. So I don't, you know, I want to make it clear that I'm a big fan of a lot of legal tech. In fact, I use a lot of it in my practice. I have to. 
Um, but the, but I think there are companies that I've seen, and you know, they've come and they've gone, uh, where they sort of start with this position that lawyers are terrible at business, lawyers are terrible at technology. So let's just sort of soft, you know, uh, what is what is word like give them a like a soft, take a softball approach or take a soft approach, not really give a robust product. And you know, I think what that leads to are things that don't quite at least you know meet certain standards. So you have um, you know, technology that might not be designed well, or technology that's only marginally better than what's available, or technology that's uh, hard to use where lawyers, even if they want the benefits, even if they understand, okay, this will make me more profit or save me time or um, lead to less frustration or errors, getting through the interface is impossible. Or um, I've even seen cases where the price point is, um, you know, I've seen one, I saw one where the price point was basically the same as hiring a person to do the same job. So I'm like, well, why, why would I use that technology? I want it to be 10% of the price of a person, you know, if it's going to be any good. Um, so there's, you know, there's that. And I think lawyers are willing to adopt technology. And I, and I really what I'm trying to do with articles like this is just sort of shake things up a little bit, um, let people know that it's a two-way sort of discourse. It's not just Lawyers don't like technology, therefore our company, you know, is failing. It has to be like you do with any other company or any other sort of sector. Talk to the users, make sure you understand what they want, make sure you understand their pain points, and make sure you understand the, um, you know, the realities of being a lawyer. Um, being a lawyer is very demanding. Um, you know, I've been a technology developer for a long time. A uh, lawyer is very demanding. People make a lot of demands on you, and you need technology that's really robust. You need technology that's dependable, and you also need technology that um, respects the sort of limits of legal ethics. So I think, um, you know, there are companies that don't understand that lawyers are bound by legal ethics, and I would actually advise a lot of companies, if you're selling a legal tech product, show that you've thought through those issues, show that you've um, given them consideration. An example would be um, something like credit card processing. That seems pretty benign, pretty normal if you're not a lawyer. But the first thing any lawyer might think about is, well, what about those fees if I'm collecting money to my trust account? You know, if I pay 3% fees to this company to process my payments from credit card into my trust account, is that misappropriation of trust funds? And that's a real question. So again, it's not that lawyers wouldn't want to use credit cards. It's that they have that concern and maybe it's not addressed. Now, there are companies that have addressed it. And so, you know, taking credit cards is kind of a no-brainer now. But, um, you know, I think you have to go through those questions. And I think um, it should be a two-way communication. It should be a two-way um, a two-way street. Then, you know, law is a really regulated industry. You know, similarly, if you were to sell software to a hospital or to a bank, it can't be. It can't be sort of half baked. It can't. You know. You, you, there's obviously value in creating MVPs, which are minimum viable products, things that you can get to market quickly. But even with those, you need to show that you've sort of crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's, and or if you haven't, explain why and explain how you'll address those issues. So I think, again, my my whole point here is to encourage a little bit of dialogue rather than placing everything squarely on lawyers to, you know, be like, hey, you guys should just adopt this and try to, you know, be like, why aren't you adopting this? Why are you Luddite? So I think there needs to be a more sophisticated discussion around technology and law. Oh, thank you. That, that is, those are great points. And in fact, I do want to kick something back to Bob for a moment. And, you know, for folks who haven't seen this site, um, Bob tracks where ABA rule one point, model rule 1.1 comment 8 which uh, I'll let him read, um, has been adopted. Um, and, in fact, though, I, I was going to ask you if certain things are put in the slide deck, Bob, here, but we've gotten in some really great questions. And so instead I'm going to kind of throw the curve here and, and, and start with, because um, I think it relates to this, which we've had someone who has asked, uh, you know, what will be the lowest common denominator of tech competency? Is this it? Is, is, is comment eight that lowest common denominator? Did we lose Bob? Mm -hmm. Seems like we might have. I think like, we may have lost Bob. Like, I'm uh, here. Can hey, you hear Bob? me? Yeah. Here, oh, there you are. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Yep, now we can. It glitched out <laughs> right. for a second here. Uh, I, I, you know, I think I think if you look at the ethics opinions, uh, talking about comment eight, that in fact it's a fairly high bar 
uh, lawyers tend to think that, you know, I noticed a couple of questions about, you know, can, can you bring in an IT consultant? Uh, can support staff help with this? And, and yes, yes to all of those. IT consultants can be important and, and support staff can be important. Um, but lawyers maintain the ultimate responsibility for every matter that they handle. And if you look at the ethics opinions under comment eight, they all say that in every single matter a lawyer takes on, whether it's a litigation matter, a transactional matter, the lawyer has to start by assessing the tech issues that may come up in that matter and assessing the lawyer's own competence to handle those tech issues. Can you hear me, Mike? I, you, I couldn't hear you for a few minutes. No, I can hear you now. I keep losing the connection. But the uh, bottom line is that these, these ethics opinions are saying that lawyers maintain responsibility to manage the matter, uh, even when they bring in outside help. And you can't manage what you don't understand. So I, I think the duty of technology competence really requires kind of a higher level uh, of competence than, than most lawyers are reading into it so far or that most lawyers realize. So I think that does become the bottom line or the common denominator anyway. Okay. Um, so I think, Bob, you and I are the only ones who are here now or something. Oh, <laughs> oh sorry. I got, I got, I got, I got cut off too. <laughs> so, um, hey, Bob, thank you. Um, I'm on back. I was talking to mute. That's my own fault. Um, so thank okay. you for that. And I, and I do think it's a great point that this is a high bar, and, and, and I think that's something – I think that should be your next article if you're not writing about the tech report uh, next – that folks do tend to say that 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 common aid is a low bar and that's wrong, um, and it's very clear from what you say here. There can be no more luddites. We've also had it asked though, uh, uh, what about folks who are unnecessarily lawyers but work with lawyers? Does this apply to them? Are there things they can do to make sure to help? Then I, I, I personally, I think this should needs to be everyone's responsibility, and this goes back to what I was saying about how I'm not sure that uh, lawyers should we, that we should really depend on lawyers to be experts in things that aren't necessarily the law. And I think we should diversify out the. I mean, while they maintain ultimate responsibility, we should diversify out who's uh, who gets to have a, a role in making sure that there's compliance and more people at all levels should be doing their, their best to make sure that, you know, we're not making mistakes uh, and that we're better serving the client ethically. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was what I was saying. I don't know if that's, uh, if anybody else had anything to weigh in there. I got, I got disconnected again, so I have to, well, I got disconnected again, so I just have to assume that whatever Joe said was brilliant, but I didn't hear it. <laughs> yeah, all right. Let, let's make that a <laughs> We'll assume that for now. <laughs> yeah, there we go. We'll, we'll all stipulate to that. So let's get back to John here, and, and, and John, talk us through, you know, where companies miss with the, with these products of theirs. Well, I, again, I think it comes back to the comments I was making earlier. Um, you know, this list of, uh, of features here, or I guess lack of features, you know, unreliability, um, lack of security that aren't, you know, that are sort of too fragile or that feel that feel like they're beta. I think, you know, and by that I mean like uh, not fully fleshed out. Um, so, you know, I've seen these these happen. If, you know, I've seen this happen a few times. Um, I've seen products out there that I feel like are more hype than substance. And, you know, again, I, I, I think lawyers don't have a lot of patience for that. I, I think, again, this is a demanding job. Um, there, there, it needs to be that these products can be adopted fairly quickly and with confidence. And, and yes, I do also think that lawyers 
do have a responsibility to to sort of take steps forward and understand, you know, learn what they don't know, build their tech competence so that they can use product, the good products that come out. And I think a lot of lawyers um, have been adopting, but I but I do think that you know I do I have seen less so now, but more so in the past where I would see people sort of blaming the market. Why aren't they adopting my product instead of sort of doing that introspection that every good company should do and be like, why isn't our product fitting our market? And so back to the in-dap survey, um, you know, we're seeing, again, lawyers that tell us they, they have many that don't feel like the software has been designed for them. Um, and then, John, you know, you've talked about this, um, but tell us, and you say this is not about disruption. You know, tell us more. Then tell us more about what they should talk to lawyers about. Well, I mean, it's it's – it's about more increasing efficiency. So it's not, you know, it's not trying to, you know, one of the things I see come up, you know, time and again that I just, you know, I won't even go into it now, but, you know, that somehow technology is poised to replace lawyers. Um, I'll say unequivocally that's not something that's going to happen in the near future. Um, so what I think companies need to do is, is explain how can this make your firm more efficient? How can you, this make your practice less stressful because you're less worried about errors? How can it help you to sort of elevate your practice to, you know, as people say, practicing at the top of your license? So you're doing less routine work, less sort of routine checking to make sure that terms are defined, which is something is, you know, that contract review software can do or document autom automation can do, and explain how it can bring you up to the role of a counselor, how it can bring, bring you up to the role of a strategist. Um, I think if companies can sort of position themselves that way, you know, how can this assist lawyers, then um, that would actually be really beneficial to them and to lawyers. You know, I think that's the message a lot of lawyers do want to hear. How will this help my practice? And so, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about disruption, which, again, that means, you know, completely replacing one, um, yeah, I guess, one incumbent field with another. So like replacing Blockbuster with Netflix. I don't think we're at that point yet. We might be in, you know, a decade or two, but as of today, I don't believe that we're at a point where disruption is really relevant to legal technology. So we'll skip this one because I want to make sure we move ahead here. And this is again, you know, you, you've talked about lawyers want technology to win. So um, let's, you know, uh, final words on this. Because, because sure. Yeah. Now, now, obviously, you know, there is variation among lawyers. And so I think, you know, a lot of the things that, you know, we've seen um, in the previous slides, there are lawyers who resist technology. There are lawyers who, no matter what you say or what you do, will not adopt something that would help them. And, and that's fine. People are different. But I think there are enough lawyers out there who do want to use better technology, who do want better tools, um, who do want to be more efficient, who want to change the way they practice. And I, and I think that they are um, open to technology. And I, and I would say that for any legal tech company, again, that's about identifying the market. You know, you have, just as with any adoption in any sector, um, you have an adoption curve. You have your early adopters. You have people who come after the early adopters. Um, you need to find those people. So don't, you know, don't worry if some, you know, somebody at a big law firm who is happy with, you know, their seven-figure payday isn't adopting your, your technology. Look for the small firms. Look for the solo practitioners who want to get better and who, you know, in the future might become those big firms. So I, I would say that. I think it's about identifying your customers properly. And, and there are plenty of customers out there. Excellent. Thank you. And so we'll end, you know, uh, that part with, once again, and these are all different Florida surveys. They do them every year. They're actually quite good. And and we'll see, you know, lawyers in Florida, whether it's Dunning-Kruger effect or not, I don't know. Um, but they do believe, the, the two-thirds of them believe that technology has changed their relationship with their clients for better. Now, some do believe it's been for the worse. Um, not sure for those who don't have clients, but, you know, again, most of them do think that technology can help and they do want it to win. So what can you do? How can you help technology to win? And so that brings us back. We're going to circle back one last time to that Thomson Reuters survey because it does show uh, an awful lot of detail with those small firms. And so, you know, Bob, when they say technology lies at the heart of nearly any solution, uh, what do they mean by that?
Uh, I don't know. I keep getting disconnected here. I I just got back on, <laughs> and I. Ooh, not good. Hopefully, you can come back, Bob. Obviously, we have. I mean, we may we may need sure. better technology at the heart of our solution to webinars. Yeah, I think I think so. So, all right. So, hopefully, you got me here. Uh, technology lies near the heart of every of nearly every any solution to almost any every problem in in the law, in legal in in the legal business. From the Thomson Reuters report, let's see if he can let's see if he's connected again, please. That would be great. I'd love to get your comment. And we may have lost them. All right, uh, I'm sorry, folks. We'll, we'll upgrade our technology uh, for the next webinar. Bob, if you do come back, interrupt me, please. Uh, so, you know, final note here. You know, again, uh, our sponsors, Woodpecker, were kind enough to help us do this and 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 gather us all together and talk about this. So, I do want to focus on one particular area: document uh, assembly and automation. And so, in that particular area, um, I'm going to posit. And not just because you know I work with them, but because there's a reason I work with them. Because their technology is simple and easy, and can be easily adopted as as simply a word plugin. You know, it, it, Thomson Reuters talks about how the average partner at a law firm can lose 32 or more hours every year to write downs. That's stuff that never even hits realization. And why? Because the drafting tools, document automation that's used properly and used well and used often can eliminate non-billable hours. I know we're all afraid of, oh, it's going to eliminate billable hours. What if it can take care of the things that you can't bill for? Wouldn't that be much better? And so your last chance to ask questions, I will say if folks want to stick around, we might do like a five-minute extra uh, time here if the panelists are willing to stay. I hope Bob can come back. This is yeah. Maybe we 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 have to we have to upgrade our own technology. And in the meantime, as those questions come in, I guess I will speak for Bob um, because wow, here's a survey we didn't cover. It seems like we covered them all. Uh, Walter's Kluwer, uh, future ready lawyer. We've got the, you know Bob, your quote that they took for you here. Uh, the best way to be future ready is not to wait until the future to prepare. Um, those are very inspiring words. And so oh, we do have one question. Um, someone has asked, has anyone looked at the possible lack of whole product which prevents mainstream users, in other words, lawyers, from adopting new technologies? That sounds like a John question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to assume what whole product means. I mean, if that means sort of a platform that would cover every law firm function, um, might be difficult to build, but I mean, if you know, you do have these sort of pieces that that do capture a lot. So something like Clio for practice management—that's just what I happen to use. There are others, or you know, any kind of marketing platforms. But I think you know, with technology, it's really about combining um, the best in class or what works best for your firm with other things that work well for your firm. So um, I think maybe it might be a difficult thing to develop a, a product that can cover the whole law firm operation, if that's what the question is. I, I think so. I hopefully that answers. Um, if not, um, we'll have contact information for everybody right here where you can reach out to the panelists. Um, all of us, these are our email addresses, every one of us, to one degree or another is highly active, maybe even some of us uh, a potential menace on Twitter. Um, I, I've been called that. Um, so you can find us all, and, and we, we encourage you, if you have questions, if you want to hear more, please do reach out to our panelists. You got, the, you got my email address wrong there, Mike? I did. Oh, I did. Just, ah. just one L on the second, <laughs> L-E-G-A-L-I-N-E dot com, yeah. All right, sorry. So there we go. I'm glad at least you're back. Welcome I back. I logged out and um, logged back so in. I don't know what was going on. But. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so 
Um, oh, we do have one final final request. We'll ask this: recommendations of podcasts. Oh, Bob, that is that is so your question. Yeah, how can we keep up with technology? <laughs> The, the Law Next podcast, uh, I highly recommend it since yeah. I do it. Um, no, you know, there's a lot of good ones out there, actually. I mean, the Lawyerist podcast is very good. Uh, Joe's uh, podcast, Thinking Like a Lawyer, uh, highly recommend yeah. it. Um, Legal Talk Network has a whole array of uh, great podcasts, uh, a number of them on legal technology topics. So. And John does the podcast, too, right, John? Um, I actually don't have a podcast. I'm one of those people who um, have meant to for a long time but never got around to doing it, but one day maybe. Okay. I'm a listener. Though. I don't know. I heard you talk live on something. I don't know. I remember it was I've something different. A, yeah, I've been on a few podcasts, but I've never actually started my own. It's one of those things where, you know, I'm looking to make the time for it, but it's valuable. As for me, I've been on a lot of them, too. I probably never will start my own because I think the general consensus is people want me to talk less. So I'm willing I'm willing to buy into that. But so to round this out, I do have to say this was fantastic. I have always wanted to do a panel with, with, with any of you individually. To do one with all of you, awesome. I really do appreciate it. So, again, Bob, Joe, John, thank you so much for attending. And as well, to our audience, thank you for attending. The questions were fantastic. Thank you for that. It's, it's sometimes we do these, and I've done these for, for years, and I get to the end, and it's crickets. No, this was great. And so to find out more about Woodpecker, go to woodpeckerweb.com. You can also email the hello at woodpeckerweb.com. Uh, you can call us if you want, if that's the way you want to do it. And finally, uh, they're on Twitter. Uh, the good news is I don't I don't handle the Twitter account, so it's way less snarky than mine. And with that, um, do know all of this has been recorded. So um, if you've got friends who missed it, please do share it. We'll be sending out copies. You'll get copies of the slides as well. We encourage you again. Send it out. Tell folks. And please do uh, connect with us. If you want to send feedback, send it to hello at woodpeckerweb.com. I should probably have this built in the Zoho somewhere, but I don't know. Um, and with that, it uh, looks like we're ending with just a minute or two over. But thank you all, and it is much appreciated.